company participated in a secret government surveillance program. The case makes no claim about what the government did with that information. The Department of Justice has argued that confirming or denying an AT&T surveillance program could aid terrorists. Earlier, a U.S. District Court rejected this argument. From the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, it's about 90 minutes. Got a sellout crowd today, huh? Uh, we'll call the matters as they appear on the calendar. First matter, Tosh Hepting versus AT&T Corporation in the United States as a defendant intervener slash appellant. Thank you, Judge Pragerson, and may it please the court. My name is Gregory Garr, and I'm appearing here today on behalf of the United States. Your Honors, the nation's top officials, whose job it is to assess and protect foreign intelligence, have determined that litigating this action could result in exceptionally grave harm to the national security of the United States. They've reached that judgment because litigating this action would require the adjudication of three central facts each of which directly implicates state secrets. First, whether or to what extent any secret intelligence gathering relationship exists between AT&T and the government. Second, whether or to what extent any alleged surveillance activities have taken place. And third, whether or to what extent any particular communications have been intercepted. As the Director of National Intelligence, and the director of the National Security Agency have explained in the public and non-public declarations filed with this court, litigating those central facts could compromise the sources, methods, and operational details of our intelligence gathering capabilities, and equally important, could disclose potential gaps in those capabilities. The state secret doctrine is a common law doctrine, isn't it? Your Honor, this court described it as a common law doctrine in the CASA decision. In our view, it also has constitutional underpinnings. We think that's supported by the Supreme Court's decision in United States versus Nixon. It's something that the Fourth Circuit recently illuminated in the El Masri case, and it's something that the D.C. Circuit discussed in the Halkin decisions. And that stems from the fundamental duty of the executive to protect the national security in our Constitution. Why? shouldn't we view the FISA law as having supplanted the common law doctrine? Uh, well, Your Honor, the, the plaintiffs in this case refer the court in particular to one provision, uh, Section 1806F. Uh, and that, that argument doesn't work for a couple of reasons. First, 1806 by its terms doesn't apply, and I'll explain why in a moment. And second, uh, under this court's decision in CASA, the court determined uh, that you need to conclude more than just that Congress uh, legislated an area, but that there is a clear statement, a clear indication on the part of Congress that it intended to supplant the state secrets doctrine. Uh, and certainly no clear statement is in the law in this case. Wasn't FISA enacted after con congressional hearings and findings about abuses of telecommunications and interceptions of telecommunications? It, it was, Your Honor, but one thing that uh, both the text of the law and the legislative history makes clear is that um, the provision I think you have in mind, 1806F, is addressed to the situation where the government uses FISA-obtained surveillance against a person who knows he's been subject to surveillance. The one court that we think has come closest to considering this issue that's the D.C. Circuit and the ACLU Foundation versus Barr case, um, concluded that FISA does not impose an obligation on the government to disclose intelligence that's never been disclosed. And that's, that's the, the, the question that the court has before it. That's so the, you, in, your, in your view, then, the state secrets doctrine would trump any congressional legislation in the FISA provisions? Well, in our view, Judge McEwen, there is no provision in FISA that supplants the doctrine, and there is, in particular, certainly no clear statement on the part of Congress that intended to supplant it. And, and keep in mind, plaintiff's argument would require the court to adopt the position that FISA establishes a FOIA provision, in effect, that would permit any criminal, any drug dealer, or any terrorist 
to come into court to bring suit to demand the United States to establish whether or not that person has been subject to surveillance and what type of surveillance. Doesn't FISA have a provision for in-camera examination of documents and determination of secrets by Article III judges? It does. It does, Judge Hawkins, and it's in 1806F. That's the provision of the statute that deals with use of information, and if you look at the terms of that provision, it refers to situations where the government is either affirmatively using the evidence against an aggrieved person. That's the term that the statute uses, and it's a term that it defines to mean someone who knows he's been subject to surveillance. The plaintiffs in this case have not offered any bit of evidence or proof to establish that they themselves have been subject to surveillance, and therefore... Let me ask you, though, one of their complaints is that there is a widespread program for domestic surveillance, and if that's true, which some people have termed a dragnet, then wouldn't these plaintiffs, like everyone, be subject to that surveillance? Let me respond to that in a couple ways. First, in fact, what they've alleged is that all or a substantial number, that's the language that comes from their complaint, have been subject to some kind of surveillance. So it's certainly not all. And second, more fundamentally, we don't think that a plaintiff can plead around the restrictions that have existed for decades on establishing their standing, on establishing an ability to proceed with a claim by pleading the broadest imaginable claim, a quote-unquote surveillance dragnet of all Americans' communications, which is something that the government, of course, has denied. Well, may I ask you about that? Because I did look. I mean, President Bush said the government does not listen to domestic phone calls without court approval. Does the government stand by that position? Yes, we do, Your Honor. And so my question is, if that's true, and presumably there's evidence to back that up since there would be nothing, since it doesn't happen and there would be documents to back up that the President has or has not authorized that, why wouldn't at least that portion of the lawsuit be permitted to proceed to, in effect, come to verification of this statement by President Bush? For these reasons, Your Honor, first of all, the court dealt with a similar issue in the Kaza case where the plaintiff sought to litigate the government's denial that the name of the location at issue was Area 51. And the court rejected the argument that because the government had made a denial that the courts could litigate the veracity of that denial because the surrounding matter was shrouded with state secrets. Second, more generally, in effect, the courts... Well, let's stop there because there it implicated state secrets. If the government is not, as alleged in the complaint, you know, intercepting millions of customers' communications, why is that a state secret? Why wouldn't the government, in fact, want to put that on the record in a sworn statement in addition to President Bush's statement? Your Honor, we would be thrilled if this litigation would go away, if the government made that denial. But I would venture to guess that the plaintiffs wouldn't accept that denial and that what they would want to do is force the government to prove the negative, which would require it to get into precisely the matters that are subject to the state secrets assertion, the sources, methods, and operational details of any surveillance activities that are taking place, and equally important, the potential gaps in any capabilities of the United States to engage in surveillance. If the denial itself would put an end to the litigation, that would be fine. But again, they, in effect, are asking the government to prove the negative, and in proving the negative, that would take the courts precisely into the heartland of the matters that are the subject of the assertion. Well, maybe one of the problems is that we're painting too broad a brush when we talk about the litigation, because as I perceive the complaint and now the documents, there's really three aspects of it, and maybe you can tell me if you agree with this. One, what I call this dragnet claim of all these communications, maybe not everyone, but many, which President Bush says doesn't happen. The second is what's now been called the terrorist surveillance program, where there is one end is foreign, and they target al-Qaeda affiliates. And then the third is what I'll call communications records. Would you agree that those are the three areas that are in the litigation? 
One of those areas is not in the litigation, and that is the terrorist surveillance program. The plaintiffs have made clear on page 82 of their red brief that that conduct is not at issue in this case. It's something that they uh, reiterated in their 28J letter with respect to the ACLU decision from the Sixth Circuit. The other two programs I would agree with you, Judge McCune, are at issue, the Dragnet and the communications records. And I think it's just to focus on the communication records for a bit because it, it has become the lost part of this case because plaintiffs have spent so little time on it in their appellee brief. The, the district court with respect to that program, as has every other court that has considered it, the district court in the Sixth Circuit case and the Sixth Circuit unanimously concluded that the existence or not of the type of communications records program that plaintiffs alleged is a state secret, is currently a secret. But the district court nevertheless allowed that claim to proceed um, under the guise that there might be inadvertent disclosures during the course of this litigation. Now on that point, if, 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 if it is a state secret, and typically if that were upheld, of course, that portion of the litigation would end, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. But of and course, if later there were disclosures, then presumably there could be subsequent litigation over that point. That's true, Your Honor. That's absolutely true. But, but what the precedents make clear is that courts should not play fire with chance and risk further disclosure once they've determined that the state secret's privilege has been properly asserted. At that point, CASA make this clear. The CASA case makes this clear. The Supreme Court's decision in Tenet makes this clear. The litigation must come to an end in order to protect the essential interests of national security that the privilege is designed to facilitate. Well, who decides whether there's whether something's a state secret or not? Well, ultimately, the, the courts do, Your Honor, in adjudicating the government's assertion of the privilege. And they do, as this court said in the CASA case, apply the utmost deference to the assertion of the privilege and the judgments of the people whose job it is to make predictive assessments of foreign well, are you Are you saying the courts are to rubber stamp uh, the, the, uh, the determination that the executive makes that uh, there's a state secret? We are not, Your Honor, and we think the, the courts play an important role. Well, what, what, is it, what is our job? Your job is to determine whether or not the requirements of the privilege have been properly met. And that includes uh, the declaration, the sworn declaration of the head of the agency asserting the privilege um, and the assertion that that individual asserting it has personal knowledge so of the matter. We, we just have to take the uh, word of the uh, of members of the executive branch that tell us it's a uh, state secret. We don't. That's, that's what you're saying, isn't it? No, Your Honor. What, what this court's precedents say is the court has to give the utmost deference to the assertion. And the second part of the of the well, what does utmost deference mean? We just bow to it? It doesn't mean abdication, does it? It does not mean abdication, Your Honor, but it means the court gives great deference to the judgments of the individuals whose job it is to assess whether or not the disclosure uh, or non-disclosure of particular information would harm national security. And the well, how, can, how can I do that? Your Honor, you would look at the declarations that had been filed with this court, yeah. the public declarations and the private declarations, and you would make a, an assessment, um, as the district court did, as to whether or not uh, there's a reasonable danger of, of harm to national security if the matters discussed are disclosed. The district so we do, court, we do that de novo then, since this is on a, a legal question on a motion to dismiss? Court? Essentially, we think the court does do that de novo, Your Honor. The district so court... So we basically start over, review the sealed record along with the public record and determine whether or not we agree or disagree with the district court. Because this is on a motion to dismiss and we think it's a legal question. The district court agreed with the government that the assertion of the privilege was proper, but it disagreed with the government as to the consequences of the application of the privilege in this case. Judge Walker thought the case could go forward notwithstanding the invocation of the privilege. And, and, and with respect to Judge Walker, we think that that's wrong. We think it's wrong for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the controlling precedents of the Supreme Court in Tenet, this court in CASA, make clear that when the very subject matter of the action is the existence of a secret espionage relationship with the government, litigation must come to, again, to an end. The, the, court, the Supreme Court put it this way in the Tenet case on page 10 of the decision. When the plaintiffs 
Success in the litigation depends on establishing the existence of a secret espionage relationship with the government. The matter cannot be litigated. As I, underst as I understand in this case, what the plaintiffs are saying is that AT&T has provided telecommunications information ab about its subscribers to the government without a warrant. And that in pursuing this claim, they don't want to know the content, the method uh, of grabbing this information, if you will. Uh, in their mind, simply providing the information uh, to an agency of the United States without a warrant is enough. Uh, Your Honor, that's, that's not correct. Certainly the, the premise of their litigation is that AT&T has entered into a secret intelligence gathering relationship with the United States. Um, but what they're seeking from the government and what they're seeking to establish is necessarily much more. Um, couldn't, and, and they prove, couldn't they prove their case by simply uh, proving that A&T has acquiesced in providing this information to the government and did so knowing there was no warrant in between? No, Your Honor, they could not do so. Um, they, they, in order to litigate the merits of this claim, this court would have to get into the details of any surveillance activities that were taking place or not. And the adjudication of that, whether any activities are taking place and, or whether any activities are not taking place, is a state secret. The Supreme Court and the Tenet case said even a small chance that some court will order disclosure of sources of intelligence, could, of, uh, the identity of the sources of intelligence could impair intelligence gathering. And May I, let me go back to my first point then. I, I can appreciate that argument with respect to what we've described as the communications records. That is the non-content, time, location, et cetera. But as to the claim of widespread domestic surveillance, which the government denies, and says that they do not do it, they don't do any such surveillance without a warrant, um, and that there is no such program. I'm having trouble understanding why you couldn't have basic discovery on that point without disclosure as to other surveillance that may or may not be taking place. Because this seems to me to otherwise put us in the position of being in the trust us category. We don't do it, trust us, and you can't ask us about it. Well, well a couple of responses to that, Judge McEwen. First of all, uh, if the court concludes, as we think it should, uh, that this case is about the existence of a secret espionage relationship with AT&T, then the court has to dismiss under the CASA and the tenant decisions. Um, but even if the court gets beyond that, um, then it has to look at whether or not this case could be litigated. And, and I bring you back to my, my prior answer uh, with respect to the denial of the existence of this alleged surveillance dragnet. The government would be put into a situation where it would have to prove the negative. And, and I think plaintiffs have made some discovery requests already in this case. And if I could just give you a sense of what they're seeking and what they, would, what they therefore believe is necessary to prove well, Let me plans. just ask you this question. You know, these are things that bother me. I mean, is it the government's position that when our country is engaged in a war, that the power of the executive when it comes to wiretapping is unchecked? It, it is not, Your Honor. And that's why we're here today. Well, what, but what are the checks on it? it uh, they, if we're getting affidavits from folks in the executive branch and we have to take their word for it, what is the check? Your Honor, this court plays an important role in evaluating uh, the legitimacy of the government's assertion of the state secrets privilege. And of course, how, how do other we, courts... How do we do that? Your Honor, you look at the in-camera submissions, and, and our position is, is those, those, the district court was correct that those submissions establish that there is, at a minimum, a reasonable danger that litigating this, this action could result uh, and exceptional harm to national security. And of course, there is a whole other branch of our government, as other courts have recognized, um, that is open and available to address um, perceived claims against the executive. This court's role what, is... What is that, impeachment? It, it, the Congress, as, as the Fourth Circuit has recognized, the D.C. Circuit 
has recognized. You said there are other avenues. What are the other avenues? Well, certainly uh, Congress has already intake, uh, undertaken uh, inquiries into issues, um, but the, the point is that plaintiffs don't have uh, the ability in this context to come into court and force the disclosure of matters that would compromise national security, force the disclosure by litigating issues that directly implicate state secrets. Which As, is what let me uh, stop you and ask you this question. Has Judge Walker made that determination? In other words, has he determined, after looking at the uh, top secret information, that the case cannot go forward without the disclosure of that information? Judge Walker believed that the case could go could forward. Could go right? forward. Could yes. go forward. And we we and, think that and, was. And ordinarily, in a piece of litigation where there's some contention that state secrets may be involved, the ordinary course, wouldn't you agree, would be to let the litigation go forward, and as the government asserts the pri privilege, the Article III district judge looks at the information in camera and then makes that determination. The government can always appeal back to us if they feel that determination is an error and against them. Why wouldn't that work here? Your Honor, it, it's not the ordinary course where the very subject matter of the action is a state secret. The Supreme Court, by unanimous vote, made that clear in the Tenet case, and it reversed a decision by this court where the court believed that the case should go forward through the use of what it called creative in-camera proceedings. Well, there's some question about Tenet and Totten, whether they really apply to this situation, because, of course, in those cases, one of the parties um, to the contract was the one suing to enforce yeah. it, in effect. And we don't have that here. What we have is the plaintiff alleging a different contract between ATT and the government. So it seems to me that there really is some feature there that the Supreme Court focused on in those cases. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I agree that it focused on it, but what it said in black and white terms is that Tenet, that the Totten is not a quote unquote contract rule. Uh, and, and, and the Kaza case establishes that because that case, after all, was not a suit against the government suing for breach of a contract. The Weinberger case establishes that, and it makes sense. If, if you think about it this way, if this action had been brought by AT&T against the government, suing for breach of some kind of alleged uh, espionage relationship, I don't think there would be any serious argument, but they would have to be dismissed under the CASA decision and the Tenet decision. And the result is no different, where a third party is bringing suit against AT&T and seeking through the courts to disclose the same type of information that AT&T would be seeking to litigate if it brought the suit on behalf See, of the See, let me go back to the discovery issue, because that follows up on Judge Hawkins as to whether the suit should be permitted to go forward in a preliminary way. Um, and then determine. So, for example, you know, not with respect to the communication record. I want to focus again on the, the very program that you say does not occur, and that is the widespread communications. And I have looked at the discovery requests, many of which would probably be barred by the state secrets doctrine. But why couldn't there be documents which would not reveal anything about surveillance, but simply be executive branch statements, whether by declaration or in documents, that no one is authorized to do indiscriminate domestic surveillance without court order. What would be, what would be a state secret about such a document? Your Honor, I want to answer your question, but I also want to um, say, just so that my co-counsel doesn't get deprived of his time, that we're dividing the argument here, and he's hopefully going to have 10 minutes of the time. So I, I see that I've gone over my 20 minutes, but of course I, I want to answer all the questions. Well, we can, we can yeah. help AT&T out. We just charge them a little over time. <laughs> Thank, <That's you>. awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, or, or we can have them dial in and start pushing buttons, you know. <laughs> Judge, Judge McKeon, I mean, ultimately the answer to that is regardless of what type of evidence um, plaintiffs might think that they could come forward with or that might exist, ultimately you would be asking the court to prove matters that are protected by the state secrets privilege. Whether or to what extent any relationship existed, whether or to what extent any surveillance activities take, took place, and whether or to what extent any particular communications were intercepted. What would be and wrong with the, um, uh, an appropriate official of the government signing the affidavit that Judge McCune suggests? 
Well, Your Honor, First again, of all, would that be subject to state secret? The affidavit itself, a sample affidavit denying that the government has intercepted the telephone conversations of American citizens without a warrant? As, as, we, as we indicated earlier, the government, the President of the United States, the Attorney General of the United States has made clear that the government is not doing that. But what would be subject to the state secrets privilege is the litigation of the veracity of that because it would put the government yeah, to prove That brings my next question. You file the affidavit and then you explain to Judge Walker why it is you can't reveal the information behind it. At least the public has the benefit of a sworn statement from a public official that what they suspect is going on is not. And, and again, Your Honor, if, if plaintiffs are willing to accept that today as a conclusion of this litigation, we'd be thrilled. Well, we, we, asking, we, we're not asking whether the plaintiff would accept it or not. We're asking really whether... And whether you'll do it. Well, whether it's so preliminary. We're just asking if, you know, we take President Bush as he says it, it seems to me that that's based on it could be not just a sworn affidavit, but there must be documents that say the same thing, whether from the NSC or otherwise, that would not be state secrets because documents that would corroborate that and say essentially the same thing would be no more of a state secret than the statement, correct? If you had a document that said exactly that, would that be a state secret? Uh, no, the denial itself, but, but going beyond that, and this is a critical point, going beyond that would, would put the court into the position of getting into the sources, methods, and operational details, no, as well as no, any potential won't. gaps in right. intelligence. Yeah. Hey, that's your way out of line making that statement. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. The, what did you just say? Uh, that going beyond the denial would take you into litigating the sources, methods, operational details, or potential gaps in that, and what we know is... Well, if that, let's say that's true, and I, understand, I appreciate the argument that you're making, and that is you can go a little ways, but in your view you can't go the entire way. Why wouldn't that determination really be made in the trial court? Because it may well be you could get summary judgment on the basis of a sworn affidavit and the supporting document, and you wouldn't need to go any further. If you did need to go further, it may well be a state secret because you would need to go into what you are doing to show what you're not doing. And, that, and I understand that's where you're saying would be a state secret, but why? The real question is, should we at this stage of the litigation, you know, simply draw the line? And, and I think the court struggled with the same exact question in the, in the, the uh, tenant case, and there was a divided decision by this court. The majority thought that the court should be creative in finding ways of going for the litigation using in-camera and other procedures. Um, Judge Tallman in dissent disagreed. He thought that precedent required the different result. And the Supreme Court unanimously held um, that where the, the, the existence of the espionage relationship is itself at issue, the litigation has to come to a conclusion. And we think that that precedent controls this clay, case. The one thing that well, intelligence Well, but the, the difference there is that you had, we, we wouldn't, in other words, ATT would fall out of this equation I'm talking about because if the government does not, as the president says, listen to domestic phone calls without court approval, it wouldn't matter whether it was, you know, ATT or Subway. Well, because if, there, if the government doesn't do it, then that's the end of the litigation on that point. I don't think AT&T falls out first because this entire action, and it's clear from paragraph two of the complaint and it's clear from all the pleadings, is predicated on the existence of this secret relationship between AT&T and their government. Their claims are that AT&T acquires information and discloses it to the government. I don't think you can peel that apart and litigate forward in this case as if the case that was brought doesn't exist anymore. But was, was, there, was a warrant obtained in, in, the, in this case? Uh, you your go Honor. The, you go through the FISA court on a, this case? A, a, again, Your, your Honor, the, that, that gets into matters that are protected by the state secrets, whether it was or whether it was not. And again, well, what we, we're, we, know, we know, we know, at least we've read, that in the past 05 and 06, there's something like more than 3,000 applications presented to the FISA court, and there was only one denial, and that was a partial denial. So we know that the FISA court is working hard. That, hope, that's, certainly get, true. that's certainly get, true, Your Honor. Um, but, but again, and this gets down to the fundamental what, point. What, I don't understand what, you're, what the problem is. The, the fundamental I just don't want to say whether this 
particular matter went through the FISA court? Can, that you, can you say that without, since those are confidential and protected I, I cannot, proceedings? I, I cannot, Your Honor, because again, it would disclose methods or means or the, abs the existence of intelligence gaps. How, to the extent that any surveillance is taking well, how place. How would that disclose the methods and means? Uh, Your Honor, everybody Gideon, knows about the FISA court. It, but but what is people do? The, the plaintiffs in this case allege that there is a secret room um, at AT and T, and that alleged activities are taking place in that room. They have no proof of that, except the affidavit from someone who says uh, that there's a leaky air conditioner and some poorly installed cable in the room, which is hardly n consistent with the sort of breathtaking program they have in mind. Um, but well, once you go beyond you. that, Your Honor. We are getting into the operational details of intelligence capabilities, and the one thing that the intelligence experts will say is the more publicly and the more concretely we educate our adversaries on our intelligence gathering capabilities, the easier it is for them to evade detection and by adapting their means. Didn't the president do that in part by making the statement that he did? And, and it, Your Honor, again, the president did deny the existence of any sort of dragnet surveillance, but again... Well, no, no, his statement was that the domestic calls of American citizens are not being intercepted without a warrant. Now, if I'm a member of Al-Qaeda, that tells me if I'm in Miami and my buddy is up in Orlando, that we can call phone to phone, and, and, and unless they've obtained a warrant, those conversations are not going to be intercepted. But the plaintiffs in this case... So Ron, he's opened the door a bit, hasn't he? Uh, the president has denied the existence of this general program. No, that's, the, but that's not what Judge McCune quoted. He said, we're not doing this. We're not doing, if it's citizen to citizen within the United States, we don't do it without a warrant. And, and in answering Judge Pragerson's question, my, I understood the question to be broader than the narrow issue that you're focusing on, uh, Judge Hawkins. I mean, the president said what he said, and certainly the United States stands behind that. Um, but that does not, uh, abrogate the state secrets privilege have to in this say case, it, right? And well, that's true, Your Honor. And again, I mean, the Casa decision dealt with the the exact same issue, and the court there agreed that litigating the veracity of a denial would take you precisely into the matters that the state secrets privilege is designed to protect. So, are you saying that even though President Bush said that that the allegations in the complaint as pled could include an allegation that ATT, apart from whatever B President Bush says? is undertaking such activities, and that for the government or ATT to defend against that well, would implicate the state secrets? Well, certainly adding AT&T into the mix creates a different dimension and brings this case squarely into the Tenet and Totten world, because there you're talking about disclosing the existence of uh, secret intelligence relationships or the non-existence of those relationships. And that, as we explained, can discourage cooperation. But let's, let's say that you said without admitting or denying, which seems to be something that is pretty common in the intelligence world and on all these documents we're looking at, without admitting or denying that the government has a relationship with ATT, I, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, from the executive branch under oath, essentially affirm what President Bush said. That wouldn't cause you to get into the secret room with leaky air conditioning, would it? Well, Your Honor, again, I mean, the government, um, the president has made a statement and the government stands behind it. Our, our view, and maybe we're wrong about this, but our view is that plaintiffs wouldn't accept that. And, and the discovery requests that they've made and the way they litigated this, litigated this action makes perfectly clear that they want to go beyond that. They want to go into what exactly was taking place, matters that would be protected by the privilege because they would either disclose sources and methods or they would disclose potential gaps in our intelligence gathering capabilities. Let me, let me ask you, just some of these things aren't clear to me. Under FISA, uh, can the government monitor foreign to foreign communications? Uh, Your Honor, the, the recent amendments... Can't you just answer that yes or no? Uh, the re I, I, it, it's, it's, no, I can't, Your Honor, because the language of FISA is very specific. Okay. There's a definition right. for electronic surveillance All and right. it's very specific. And the, and the recent amendments to FISA um, make clear that electronic surveillance does not include in, uh, surveillance that is directed at uh, foreign individuals. Does not include surveillance directed that's, at that's foreign individuals. That's correct, individual. Your Honor. Um, I mean, I'm talking about people in 
Are you talking about people in foreign countries the, or foreign individuals who are here? The recent amendment, Your Honor, and I direct you to the language, uh, makes clear that that is accepted from the definition of electronic surveillance. A phone call from Finland to Japan. You're talking about outside the territory of the United States. It, it says directed at foreign individuals, individuals who are reasonably believed. That, um, and, and that, and that the, 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 the answer to those questions, Your Honor, I mean, FISA says what it, it says, um, and Congress has recently amended that. Well, but wait, the individual, you're, the, you're the expert. Some of this stuff confuses me. I'm just trying to get some answers, that's all. And then so I, I answer your question. I don't know. Does it cover foreign to foreign? We're not sure. Foreign, foreign to U.S. Your Honor, again, I, I point you to the, the recent definition, which exempts from the definition of electronic surveillance surveillance that is directed at individuals reasonably believed to be foreign individuals. But re um, individuals recently what? Reasonably to believe believed to be foreign. FISA ultimately um, was not concerned with that type of surveillance, and it's something that Congress has reaffirmed in the recent amendments. Plaintiffs in this case, um, of course, have abandoned their well, claims. Does FISA apply to U.S., someone in the United States to someone in the United States? It, someone in New York calling someone in San Francisco? Your Honor, I, I think ordinarily it would. There's a very complicated definition of electronic surveillance, and I'm not certainly not trying to be um, evasive on this or trying to be difficult, but it's a very complicated technical definition of s electronic surveillance, yeah. and that complicates the litigation of it's, questions it as well. It can't be any more complicated than my phone bill. Well, <laughs> I, but, and certainly, I'm, I think I'm, I could agree with you on I'm that. I'm having Ron. trouble with that. Now, what, this uh, Protect America Act of 2007, what effect does that all have on this case? Well, Your Honor, Plaintiffs have brought a FISA claim, so ultimately in the litigation of that claim, the court would have to view the recent amendments, particularly with respect to any uh, prospective relief. But fundamentally, we don't think that any of their claims can be litigated without getting into matters protected by the state secrets. The three matters that I've already mentioned, so the, really whether or not any ex relationship existed, whether or not any particular surveillance activities are taking place, and whether or not, and this is a critical piece, which. I hope Mr. I assume Mr. Kellogg is going to talk about whether or not any particular communications have been intercepted, which if you get beyond all the other issues that we've discussed, plaintiffs could not establish their standing in this case because they couldn't establish whether or not their own so, communications have been so, intercepted. So the, the bottom line here is that uh, uh, once the executive declares that certain activity is a, is a state secret, that's the end of it. It's, it's no, not it's too, no too cases, no litigation, uh, absolute immunity. The king can do no wrong. But it's about what it comes down. No, to. Your Honor. Um, first of all, as I explained, although the courts do do give the utmost deference to the assertion of the privilege, that is not absolute deference. The court plays an important role. And second, as this court said in the Kaza case, although dismissal is a harsh remedy, it's the remedy in this context which is for what the court called the greater public good. If, if I have any time remaining, I'd like to reserve the balance of my time uh, for rebuttal, unless the court has further questions. I guess my only question or comment on your final remark is that we have a denial here of broad spread domestic surveillance. But if we didn't have a denial, and if the government were undertaking that, I imagine from your comments that your response would be we can't, no one could litigate that kind of an invasion because of the state secrets doctrine. Well, well uh, the Supreme Court has rejected the notion that the fact that plaintiffs are asserting constitutional rights means that the privilege can't apply. This court had a different view in the Tenet case. But, but I think my question calls for a simpler answer of yes or no. Is your answer that no? Uh, if there were, in fact, widespread domestic surveillance of American citizens without a warrant, there would be no judicial remedy to challenge that, uh, yes or no, in your view? I would answer it this way, and I make it as direct as I can. If the courts looked at the in-camera submissions of the executive and concluded, agreed with the executive's submission, that litigating the case could result in grave harm to the national security, 
the answer would be that action could not go forward, but ultimately the court would have the role in making that determination. Even if the in-camera submission were a denial? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, thank you. AT&T. AT&T. Thank you, Judge Pregerson, and may it please the court, Michael Kellogg on behalf of AT&T. I'd like to make three points today focused on the issue of plaintiff's standing. And the first point is that the questions that the court would have to resolve in order to determine that the plaintiffs have standing are the very questions as to which the government has invoked the state secrets privilege. In other words, they would have to show not only that there is such a dragnet program, but that AT&T participated in it, and that their own individual communications were captured pursuant to that. But those precise questions which are necessary to standing are ones that the government, invoking the state secrets privilege, according to proper procedures, have said cannot be litigated and cannot be resolved one way or another. AT&T is not allowed to put in any defense with respect to those questions. Evidence is not allowed to be presented on those questions. Under those circumstances, at this stage in the litigation, as you asked, Judge McEwen, courts have repeatedly said that once it becomes clear that the very questions at issue cannot be litigated, the case has to be dismissed. That's what this court did in CASA what the Supreme Court did in Tenet, it's what the Sixth Circuit did recently in the ACLU v. NSA case, and what the Fourth Circuit did recently in El Masri. Do you have any, do you have any other case that you can think of where a third party brings a challenge to a contract between the government and a company or third party such as ATT? Well, there's a number of cases involving third party suits against private individuals in which the government intervenes and invokes the state secrets privilege. But in those cases, is there a claim of a contractual relationship between that third party and the government? That's what I'm trying to assess is, is there any other case other than Tennant and Totten from which we would draw any guidance on the contractual issue? Well, a couple of points on that. First of all, um, they are alleging here a relationship, an espionage relationship between the United States and AT&T, which raises a classic Tenet and Totten question. But the state secrets privilege is not limited to such questions. It extends far beyond the scope of individual espionage relationships into any discovery into methods, modes, and operations of clandestine government programs, which are alleged to be at issue here. But the, the, the president has said, with respect to widespread domestic uh, telecommunications interceptions, that's not happening. Why, why wouldn't, how would it impact any relationship AT&T might have with the government or implicate state secrets if that's the case? Because in order to litigate the question, it's going to be necessary to present evidence as to just what, if anything, AT&T is doing in cooperation with the NSA. The plaintiffs why, were not why would satisfied. You, why, why would you have to do that? I mean, that's really kind of where we get into the rub. If, let's just assume that AT&T is doing something with the government that implicates intelligence gathering. So we'll put that over there. The question is, is ATT doing something where there's no warrant required? Why would that require ATT to put at issue the first agreement that we referenced? Because the government has said that whatever, if anything, ATT is doing with the government is a state secret, and we're not allowed to put in any evidence whatsoever on the question. And as a consequence, no evidence can come in as to whether the individual plaintiff's communications were ever intercepted and whether we played any role in that. Judge Hawkins, you asked about cases. Why can't the case go forward to allow evidence to 
presented as it has been in a number of other cases where the questions at issue are peripheral to the state secrets. For example, in United States v. Reynolds, there was a plane crash. The plane had secret information on it. The court said, okay, you, you cabin that off and you can proceed to deal with the question of whether there was negligence involved and whether these plaintiffs were harmed. In In Re Sealed Case, recently decided by the D.C. Circuit, the court said the question at issue there, whether a State Department employee improperly surveilled another employee was not a state secret and that the state secret evidence was not entwined with the evidence that the plaintiffs would need to make their prima facie case. But here that is certainly not true because the court cannot make a resolution of the question, is AT&T participating, are they not participating, were plaintiffs' communications surveilled, were they not surveilled, because those are the very questions on which the court, the government has invoked the state secret privilege. Well, let, let me just harken back to my lawyer days and I could see a very simple document request. It would run something like this. To ATT, produce any agreement, you know, document or otherwise, between ATT and the government with respect to listening to domestic phone calls without court approval. I would simply mimic President Bush's words. And presumably, taking President Bush at his word, ATT's response would be, no such document exists, correct? I assume that would be the response. I have no idea actually what is going on, but I, I well, assume that would be the response to that question. <laughs> Let's hope it's that. It's a state secret. I have no idea what ATT well, how would is. It be every, is how would it be a state secret if there were no document that authorized ATT to listen to domestic phone calls without court approval? Now, if, if there were such a document, then maybe you'd have to say state secret. But if there is no such document, and ATT doesn't do anything more than President Bush says, wouldn't that be the end of it? And if, and if the plaintiffs wanted more information, then maybe you'd get into the state secret. But why couldn't ATT say whether it has this document in its possession, which is an agreement um, to listen without court approval? Because any sort of probing into what, if anything, AT&T is doing for the government has been designated as a state secret. Even if it you, doesn't exist? It's a state secret that it doesn't exist? You know, as Mr. Garr said, even gaps in intelligence gathering can be state secrets. What the government is not doing can be a state secret. But President Bush cases. said they're, they're not doing it, so it can't be a state secret that they're not doing it if ATT simply confirmed it has no such agreement. I mean, why couldn't the litigation go at least that far and then leave to Judge Walker to determine, well, if that's the end of the road or not the end of the road? Well, I'm not sure how it could not be the end of the road, but plaintiffs clearly will indicate that it's not. Plaintiffs, if you saw their discovery request, which are in the, the record materials, the materials that they wanted go far beyond the scope of that. Indeed. Well, maybe they're not proper discovery requests. I'm just asking you based on everything we have in our record, going back to this issue of, of how is it that the public is going to have some assurance on the record that this is not occurring without getting into what may or may not be occurring with ATT on other fronts. Well, Your Honor, if there's a remand to say that a simple denial is sufficient to end the case, I believe Mr. Garr said that that would satisfy the government. Um, I won't I'll let him clarify that on rebuttal if he says so. Well, it might be a good PR move, huh? Sorry, Your Honor? It, it might be helpful in uh, assuring the public that what is alleged in part in this complaint, widespread dragnet domestic uh, interception of private telephone conversations is in fact not occurring. Well, the, the president has already you know, issued a denial that that is occurring. Um, plaintiffs obviously are not satisfied with that, that. They've presented No materials. court in the land would be satisfied with a public statement 
by anyone, be it the president or the, of the United States or the president of AT&T or the custodian of the air conditioner in that room on Folsom Street. What would be required would become some kind of affidavit, right? Well, as I say, I leave it to the government whether, whether they'd be satisfied with that approach. Certainly AT&T would be very happy to have the case end on those terms. Um, I would like to stress that the second point that I wanted to make, if I, I'm not quite sure how much time I actually had um, given the overrun, um, but that the plaintiffs here have abandoned Judge Walker's approach to this case. Judge Walker thought that the case could go on through a somewhat complicated series of reasoning dealing with the terrorist surveillance program, which the plaintiffs have abandoned on appeal. Their whole theory has to do now with the Klein and Marcus materials, which Judge Walker rightly said were insufficient to establish a prima facie case and that he would not rely upon them. And at best, what those materials do is they speculate about what a certain configuration of equipment would be capable of doing, but they provide no indication as to what is actually happening in the so-called sealed room, what information, if any, is being turned over to the NSA as part of the alleged program. Well, let, let me ask you about this. This is a kind of an odd case because it's a motion to dismiss with, you know, a record the size of this mystery room, I think. Um, and so we're not just sitting here with, you know, this complaint on a motion to dismiss. Judge Walker found through stringing together various statements that ATT must be involved. Um, do we look at that conclusion on a de novo basis or on some other standard of review? A review, I, I would note that the government also made a motion for summary judgment. Correct. Uh, but Judge Walker's decision was on the motion to dismiss and there is de novo review of a decision on a motion to dismiss. So where, in your view, did Judge Walker go wrong in coming to his conclusion about AT&T? Well, he speculated that if there were a large program going on, that the government would need help from large telecommunications carriers, that AT&T is the largest carrier, that AT&T has a history of having government contracts and confidential um, relations with the government, and therefore um, that it was reasonable to infer that possibly AT&T participated. Now, as I say, we, we obviously attacked that series of reasoning in our brief. As I say, the plaintiffs have not defended it. Uh, they have abandoned it on appeal, and they have instead tried to rely on the Klein and Marcus materials, which we're Which Judge Walker did not do. Which Judge Walker did not do and which are clearly inadequate under Tenet v. Doe, the Supreme Court's decision, and under this Court's decision in CASA, where there were also attempts to present affidavits or other evidence um, showing some sort of showing that what is a secret um, is not actually a secret because there's some information out there. And what the Supreme Court made absolutely clear in Tenet v. Doe is that the mere fact that there's some information floating around there in the public domain does not mean that it is not a state secret at issue because there can be all sorts of small bits and pieces that are critical to the intelligence determination and that the director of intelligence deserves the utmost did, did, deference in that determination. Did Judge Walker get into the state secret issue? and? Any depth? Um, well, he did not discuss the sealed materials in any depth, but my understanding is he did examine those materials with great care. He determined that the state secret privilege was properly invoked procedurally uh, okay. by um, both the director of national intelligence and the director of the NSA. Uh, his issue then was whether there were enough extraneous information out there to say that, well, maybe it's not a state secret after all. He's dealing with a, a motion to dismiss. Uh, doesn't take much to, uh, to um, affirm a denial of a motion to dismiss. 
Well, that's why the point I tried to make at the outset is so critical. It's because the very questions that would have to be resolved in order to establish that plaintiffs even have standing, Article III standing to bring this case, are themselves been properly designated as state secrets, which means that we can't litigate those questions, we can't provide any defense on them, and the court cannot ultimately resolve those The questions. plaintiffs uh, are clear in saying that in the AT&T case that they think they can prove their case without any of that. They do, relying on Klein and Marcus, which Judge Walker found insufficient, which for the reasons we explain in our brief are insufficient. They at most establish um, what a certain configuration of equipment might be capable of. If you read the Marcus Declaration with care, he talks about capability at least 12 times in there. And he concludes that with this configuration, traffic quote, would have been available for interception. That is not a conclusion that individual people's traffic was intercepted. Indeed, he himself refutes the dragnet by saying, well, this configuration actually would not allow you to listen in on ordinary telephone calls, and it wouldn't allow any interception of traffic between AT&T customers. So there are gaps even what he says might be possible under the configuration. Certainly there's no basis on which the plaintiffs would be able to establish standing under those circumstances or that AT&T would be able to litigate the question, because our hands are completely tied here by the government's invocation. Well, that'd be something Judge Walker will have to look into in the future, I suppose. Well, not under this court's precedence and Supreme Court precedence, once the determination is made. And a, a final point I'd like to make, if I may, of concerning the records program, is that the plaintiffs don't even pretend to have a prima facie case there. They don't pretend to have any legitimate evidence that a call records program, they cite a few stray newspaper reports, some congressional statements, but under well-established precedent, none of that material is sufficient to abrogate the state secrets privilege. And every judge to have considered the question has said this is a legitimate invocation of the state secret privilege. The Sixth Circuit recently dealt with the same issue and even the dissenting judge in that case said that the call records portion was properly dismissed at the outset for lack of standing. All right, does that do it? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. May it please the court, Robert Fram for the plaintiffs. Your honors, we believe that dismissal of this case is premature for two very simple reasons. First, the statute. Congress established causes of action, private rights of action, directed against persons such as AT&T when they act under color of law and improperly conduct electronic surveillance. In plain English, Congress established private rights of action when AT&T has a surveillance relationship with the government, with the NSA. Now, Congress was not unmindful of the need to protect national security. What I've said is it would be an extraordinary case for that mere relationship of a person acting co under color of law and conducting surveillance to be able to... Let me ask, ask you this. Had the, had the uh, government gone to the FISA court and gotten authorization for whatever is happening, huh? Uh, would you be here today? We would have a very different set of claims, Your Honor. It would have to do with whether they satisfied the substantive provisions of FISA. Let's assume they did. If, if, if they did, the claims as we pled them would not be here today. How would you know that? Well, I mean, that's an interesting, a very interesting question. <laughs> I mean, question. You're talking, we have to talk practicalities right. here, because if they'd gone to the FISA court, and maybe they have, we don't know. Right. But 
your answer doesn't really make sense to me in a practical consequence of saying well we'd have a different case what would you know that would put you in a different position sometimes we find out things the FISA court does sometimes we don't okay. so I can't speculate as to those those circumstances but in terms of what we have here as I said Congress thought about how to handle the problem of national security in a claim against a party acting under color of law conducting electronic surveillance. This is not a one-sided statute or one-sided act on Congress's part. That is why it enacted Section 1806F, so that the Attorney General, upon seeing a request for discovery implicating national security concerns, could go to the district court obtain in camera review that's mandatory does notwithstanding any other law that would happen and the district court then looks at the material in dispute this would not be a hollow exercise in this case while the AT&T and the government have sought to characterize the Klein evidence as being uh, speculative, as being hearsay, as being a, a, a story about an air conditioner, if one actually fairly looks at the evidence itself rather than the characterization of the evidence, we see some very specific points which we believe clearly establish our claims. There's a splitter cabinet on the seventh floor at, this, at 611 Folsom Street. Mr. Klein declares that under penalty of perjury. How does he know that? He knows it because it was his job, as he tells us in paragraph 15 of his declaration, to oversee the room where the splitter cabinet is installed. He tells us in paragraph 36 that he personally installed the circuits in the splitter cabinet. And what does it do? Mr. Klein tells us the splitter cabinet splits a fiber optic signal. And what happens next? He provides an exhibit, which is, the exhibit is under seal, so I cannot quote from the exhibit. It's under seal because AT&T is contended it's proprietary, but it is described in the Klein Declaration, which is in the public record. And what the splitter cabinet does is it sends the light signal from the seventh floor on Folsom Street to the sixth floor where the SG3, that stands for Study Group 3, Secure Room, is located. How do we know that? He attaches Exhibit C to his declaration. <coughs> Exhibit C provides, and I can't quote it again, it's under seal, but it's described, the manner in which these connections are made. And if there's any question as to it, I would at least direct the court, it's a long document, to page 122 in the excerpts of record as regards it to see whether or not this is a credible statement. But one needn't take our word for it, that this isn't just hearsay or speculation. AT&T vigorously sought the return of the Klein materials unsuccessfully in the district court. They submitted a declaration, also still under seal, by one Mr. Russell. And I direct the court's attention to paragraphs 19 through 23 of the Russell Declaration where he says, I cannot quote him, but where our brief describes how he describes that this is about the facilities at issue. Again, there's a short declaration. I commend it for the court's own review. My point of describing the evidence is simply this. If one takes Congress's balanced scheme and says, look, when people engage in surveillance relationships with the government, presumptively there's a right of action. But if we're concerned about national security, 1806F should apply. In this case, there's a lot to apply it to. There's a lot of what real is, evidence. What is your response to the earlier argument that 1806F isn't sure. really applicable here by its terms in the way it reads with respect to an aggrieved person and putting this matter in evidence? The government says, makes the following arguments as to the non-applicability of 1806F. One is the definition of aggrieved person, and the other has to do with whether it only is triggered by persons who are defending against the use of information obtained through the surveillance. I understand their arguments. We believe neither uh, um, 
it makes sense in light of the statutory language. First, the statutory language specifically is broader than individuals who have provided, been provided with notice that the government's going to use the information or who are seeking motions to suppress. There is a third clause in 1806F, and that third clause in the disjunctive concerns any discovery motion whatsoever. That is not, the statute by its terms is expressly not limited to persons who are in a motion to suppress posture or dealing with the use of evidence against them. That's first. Second, a grieved person. But where is that in 1806F? If one looks in 1806F, and I believe it's in paragraph, I think in our statutory appendix, I believe it's on 2A. Just tell me the surrounding language. Sure. We're, all, we're dealing okay, with we can, different we, Okay, different, different statutory appendix. Yes. Um, Just tell me what the surrounding language sure. is. Sure. So it's the language that I'm referring to is, it says. Is that in camera and ex parte review? Is that before, before, after one gets there, or to discover or obtain applications or orders of, or other materials relating to electronic surveillance. That's the language that I'm quoting from. It says, when, and it talks, whenever any motion request is made by an aggrieved person pursuant to any other statute or rule of the United States, or to discover or obtain applications or orders. But then doesn't it go on in making the determination they go back to the aggrieved person situation? Aggrieved person, it has to be an aggrieved person. I, I agree with your honor on that. I, I'm simply making the point that it does not have to be a person who is defending against a, the use of evidence. It is a very broad grant of review for all discovery motions. On the question of aggrieved person, aggrieved person yeah. one looks at the definition of aggrieved person in section 1801. What is clear there are two things. First, it does not say an aggrieved person is a notified aggrieved person or a person who has already established that they are aggrieved. That is the same definition that appears in the private right of action under section 1810. In other words, 1810 says you have a private right of action if you're an aggrieved person. An aggrieved person is a person who is, by the definition, merely subject to electronic surveillance. Not who's already established that they are subject to electronic surveillance. Not if they have been notified that they are subject to electronic surveillance. So what we have is a, a standard statutory provision providing Doesn't a Doesn't that kind of beg the question, we're still back to the standing issue of whether they're aggrieved from a constitutional or prudential dimension or whether they're aggrieved pursuant to the statute and whether they can prove that without invoking the very state secret well, that is being argued about. And I'd like to address that directly. The only point I was making here is that there's nothing in the statute saying you first have to prove that you were subject to surveillance before you can bring your claim. And the government's reading of aggrieved person would have that effect. Now, as to what it is we do need to show, to answer your Honor's question in terms of on standing, it's important again to look at what the claims under, say, FISA or Title III require. The gist of our claim, the gist of the evil here is in the improper giving of the communication. It's in the acquisition by a device is what the definition of electronic surveillance, and that's in 1801 F subparagraph two provides. It's the acquisition of a communication by a device without consent. No reference whatsoever to a human being reading it. No reference to an NSA technician analyzing it. No reference whatsoever to what goes on inside the SG3 secure room. Put in the concrete factual terms of our case, we have completed privacy violations upon the handover of the copy of the internet traffic at the splitter cabinet and it's transferred to the SG3 secure room, which room has access that is limited to NSA cleared personnel. 
And are you referring now to records communication or also to content? Well, clearly as to the content, as to the records, we believe records are within the definition of content under the, st under the FISA statute, which is not limited by its plain language to uh, the verbal content, and it can include in information regarding the existence or identity. Um, there's so, a broad, I'm sorry. So let me just be clear, is, is the room, however one may or may not conceive it, essential to your claim of widespread domestic surveillance? Yes, sir. The, the, the fact that there's a mass handover uh, of a copy of communications to a room as to which access is limited to NSA cleared persons, that is the gist of our, of our dragnet claim. What is not implicated in our dragnet claim is what happens inside the room. So that goes then back to a topic I was discussing both with ATT and the government, and that is President Bush's statement that there is not any domestic surveillance without judicial authority. If that were established, with respect to the claim of widespread domestic surveillance or dragnet, what, that, what would be left of your claim? Well, one has to be careful, as the government is careful, in reading their words and exactly what they're saying. My understanding is the president says that they're not trolling through the communications of ordinary Americans. I do not know that the government has ever said we are not obtaining a fiber optic split of all internet traffic. If they have information, in other words, that basically what Mr. Klein says and what his documents say are wrong, then that is exactly the sort of thing that one would expect to see hashed out in an 1806F procedure in front of Judge Walker. So it may or may not be that the declaration is provided, that has been contemplated here to be provided by the president would be adequate. We didn't suggest that there would be okay. need to be any kind of declaration okay. by the president okay. just to be clear on the record. Okay. But it's not clear what he would say and... It wouldn't, it wouldn't have to be the president. It could be okay. a member of the executive branch and I wouldn't expect it would be the president, uh, would you? Uh, I, I would agree, uh, unlikely. It might be the attorney general. Um, but in, in any event, the, one would have to look carefully at the words of whoever said it on behalf of the administration and see whether or not it met the specific factual points that are in the record. And by the way, Judge Walker never said that he did not find the Klein evidence um, to lack credibility. He actually went out of his way to say he was not passing on that, this issue at the time. What we believe the statute calls for is exactly an evaluation of those points. And, and one final issue. There's been a concern around the Klein evidence that might improperly be opening the door that anyone could come off the street and jeopardize the national security of the United States. I want to take a look at the narrowness of what we're proposing here. First, this is evidence as to which the Assistant Attorney General expressly declined to assert the privilege. And he did it twice, because Judge Walker asked him. And he expressly declined to assert the privilege not only over the declarations, but over the exhibits, the very exhibits that AT&T fought ferociously to have returned because they thought, they thought they were so valuable and proprietary. Well, there is a difference, of course, between trade secret proprietary information and a state secret. We understand that, but we think it's an odd circumstance for them to have it both ways and say, this information is all hearsay and speculative and trivial and should be disregarded, and at the same time um, say, but of course it's incredibly proprietary, important, and valuable when it comes to speak. It's a trade secret. So, you, but, but the gist of your claim, then, is that ATT has a device by which it is acquiring data and or 
voice communications. Is that Cer correct? Certainly data, we believe, voice over IP. It's internet traffic. VOIP, so. Yeah. So is, there's a third kind of communication, of course, and that's just the standard um, telephony, and that is with uh, phone calls, what we call phone calls. Do right. your allegations include a claim that there is either monitoring or acquisition of phone call content? They do, Your Honor. And as to that, the, um, the Klein material speaks to Internet traffic. Our point there is simply this. The government has made a very broad contention that the entire subject matter of AT&T's surveillance relationship with the NSA is a secret. We're saying we've proven it already. We've not only alleged it, we've proved it. And so we're saying in this case, where, that, where you've gotten that far. What have you proved? What? You've, you've proved that some NSA guy was supposed to show up in the room. I mean, that's what the well, actually, youth Klein and Marcus, I mean, you haven't proved one way or the other what is or is not the relationship between ATT and the government, have you? What we have, what, what, if one looks at Klein in paragraph 17, in paragraph 14, he says the following, that as regards the SG3 secure room, first, the ordinary technicians who worked in the building with him did not have access. Second, that only field um, support specialists, he designates number two, he does not use his personal name, had access. <coughs> Subsequently, field support specialist three, when the first individual left. Third, that those individuals, only those were individuals who had clearances from the NSA. Now, it may be he's wrong. It may be that AT&T can come in or the government can come in with evidence to Judge Walker and say, that's unfortunately not true. SG3 secure room is available to everyone or the full technician force. That predicate is wrong. They've done no such thing as far as we know. I, I don't know everything that are in their confidential papers, or, but in the argument they've made on the public record that's been available to us, they've never said any such thing. They attack Klein's point out, allegation on this specific issue as hearsay and is made on his knowledge. Well, that he made it on his knowledge that the only people allowed in the room after he works there every day just not, strikes us as a perfectly appropriate assertion. He can be challenged, but there's nothing speculative about it. He's, they say, well, he was told by another person, some, the field support um, person well, number one. But let me just say that I'm just trying to narrow so, this. Let's say we take him at the word. He, there is a room. People that work there have NSA clearance. Then there's another affidavit that said that the equipment has certain capabilities, correct? For, uh, he d actually does say that, and that's in the documents, as does Marcus. It's all discussed. However, our point as regards electronic surveillance being defined as acquisition by a device without consent um, is that that violation is complete when the information is sent from the splitter cabinet in the seventh floor over to the SG3 secure room, which is a, faci a facility, a room that NSA controls. Now, without a warrant. Without any, without any legal authorization. When done without legal authorization. Correct, Your Honor. Uh, there's one aspect what here. If, well, let me just sure. speculate, because that seems to be what we need to do when we don't have certain facts that anyone can talk about. But what if there were a warrant, but because of various other security regulations, they couldn't tell you about that warrant, or they couldn't tell you about some other authorization. If they have a warrant, or if they had a certification, their defenses, their statutory defenses, certifications, um, we believe all of that would be information they should properly put in front of Judge Walker. But it's very clear, NSA, a person with the NSA clearance is a person performing or assisting the performance of a government function. In the record with the executive order, it's, it's, it's 12968. It's in the record, I believe, at SCR 697. And it's very clear. It says that you only get those clearances if you have a need to know. That's in section 1.2. 
And it says a need to know is defined in section 1.1H as a person who assists or performs a government function. The violation is complete at the splitter cabinet. When they take well, then, that like if, if that's true, then it wouldn't matter whether there is or is not an NSA person? There has to be. Or you need that for your color of law? Uh, for under, acting under color of law, Your Honor, that there has to be some, that nexus. But if, but if, it's, if the acquisition is complete, why, does, why can you have, say then, just because you have a, an NSA guy in there, that it's occurring under color of law? Well, the, stat, the claim is. I understand what the claim is, okay. but I'm asking of the evidence, not the claim. Sorry. That well, the, because you say, you're saying that simply because there's an NSA person inside the room, that that gives you the color of law. We're saying that access to the room is restricted to persons with NSA clearance, not merely that there happens to be an NSA person who floats through the room. So it's, ha it's a handover of the fiber optic split to an NSA control, to a room as to which access is limited in that way. Um, much was made previously, if I might turn to um, the uh, Totten and Tenet cases, and just to briefly address that, um, I believe one of uh, the governor of AT&T said that Tenet said that Totten was, there's language there saying that this is not um, just a contract bar case. I think it's useful to look at the actual language of the opinion itself um, and um, looking at uh, 544 U.S., I believe, page 7. The issue there, of course, it was a claim brought by one of the spies. It was not a third party, but they brought claims based on due process and estoppel. And it was in the context of that situation that the Supreme Court said it does not matter how the spies dress up their claims how the spies dress up their claims. This is not about third parties. We do not have a, a case where Congress enacts a statute. It's directed at persons who have a surveillance relationship. It pro Congress provides for ways to consider how that could be a secret, even though they created the private causes of action, where there's evidence to consider as to how to deal with it. And the court says, at this early juncture, at the threshold, we're going to stop the case. On the contrary, I would say the case that we suggest provides very, very good guidance as to what to do here is the recent DC Circuit case, the In Re Sealed case that came out in July. It's provided under Rule 28 to the court. Some very interesting facts about the case to put it on all fours with this case. Because it was not dealing with an 1806 review process. It was just trying to figure out how do we deal with a state secret case where we have some secret and non-secret evidence. And we've got the government arguing that this non-secret evidence is mere hearsay. What do we do? And what it found was as to one of the defendants, it was to remand it and to have the district court conduct what it called a tailored in-camera review and to segregate the secret and the non-secret evidence. So even if the court were to accept the government's arguments regarding the limits of 1806F, which we would suggest would not be the right reading, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, as the DC Circuit pointed out, it doesn't make sense to dismiss this case at the threshold when there's this amount of non-secret evidence Evidence that is credible on its terms, that is documented, that AT&T has vouched for, and as to which the government has itself expressly declined to assert the privilege. That's a very narrow case. This is not opening the floodgates to but so you attacks. Know, if you think of the sealed case out of the D.C. Circuit, the facts were, were with a fair amount of precision, you had an individual State Department employee who claimed his communications were intercepted, and he had the exact uh, statements that he had made that were then transmitted and repeated. Um, of course, all of that he knew. It didn't, was no state secret involved in that. So you had 
a non secret component that was essential both to his standing and to his prime official case and you don't really have that with respect to your plaintiffs i mean they they really don't stand in the same position as this charge a fair from the state department well in some says your honor we think our actual evidentiary situation is superior we have as the establishment of the existence of the splitter cabinet the making of the copy the routing of the copy and the sending it to the sg3 secure room where the access is controlled we have sworn declaration on all points if you one looks at the dissent in in ray sealed case it's quite harsh in looking at the um evidence that the um plaintiff had there um i thought they, they say it's a a cable a table and some gossip or something because there was a question about or the apparent lie of the uh, of their adversary but the, the thought was how on such a flimsy batch of evidence um, not documents that their adversary had tried to get, obtain in return how on that sort of flimsy evidence could this go forward and not inevitably wind up with a risk to the disclosure of secure national security information that was the that was the counter argument uh, in, in a sense let me, let me just i just want to be clear on your point from before to make sure i understood that central to your claim all of your claims then is the existence of the splitter cable and the existence of the room but not what goes on inside the room what go that is correct what goes on inside the room is not central to our claims not it has all a Las Vegas quality about it in other words what goes on here stays here is that <laughs> basically your argument it's a what once it's hand over to the NSA your honor um that the you know to or to a, a room as to which access is restricted to persons who are assisting the NSA um that is all we need we do so not you're saying you don't care for purposes of your claim what the NSA does or doesn't do if they do anything with it it's just the fact that the NSA gives its imprimatur as color of law to the splitter cable that's your case in a nutshell yes your honor because what Congress did when it passed these statutes it established a protective perimeter for our privacy it looked at what had gone on previously in mass intercept and improper mass interceptions in the cold war and the vietnam war and it wanted to have some set of rights that could be clearly and easily enforced without people having to dive into the specifics of who's a target or not it was said several times that we have to know if we're a target or not we don't we absolutely don't if if you were part of a mass dragnet and your email goes to Folsom street and that's a copy is made and given to the NSA it does not have to mean that you are a target and there's no need here to disclose what who the NSA is targeting in many cases there's a concern in surveillance that the government should not disclose who is being targeted because it is a mosaic intelligence analysis the concern is that the enemies of this country will get, obtain valuable information if they know who is or is not being targeted we need no such information So the entire suggestion that that's a block on standing is, is, is simply not right. Um, I also confess to have lost track of the time, and I'm also not sure, frankly, what the rules are regarding time. Um, but let me just see if there's anything more of great note. Um, yeah, we don't want you to leave out anything important. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, there's one item that the government has not discussed yet, but they may because it's in their briefs. They often say they can't come in with a certification defense because it will give away the very secret. Um, I would simply commend the court to look at the actual language of the certification provision itself. Again, here's where Congress was trying to have a balanced scheme to allow these claims to go forward while protecting national security. Because in the certification provision itself, it says that if a carrier obtained a valid legal certification, 
This is under 2511-2A-2. In our statutory appendix, it's at page 10A. It says if they got the certification, which requires them to disclose, to make sure that they've identified the duration of the surveillance and the information being sought and the facilities used, if they do all of that, then they have an obligation to keep confidential the surveillance, with, but only with respect to what was certified. So the suggestion that they can't litigate the certification and they will not have a defense and they can't use their defenses, Congress already thought of that. Congress already said, we understand that you may get a certification and do all these things, and it might have to be kept confidential if you do it. Of course, if you're doing things that were not certified, you are outside of the confidentiality cloak provided by Congress. And certainly there's no provision to say, you don't even have to bother to get the certification, just like you don't have to bother to get a warrant, just to assert the state secret privilege and you're done. That seems to be completely contrary to the scheme Congress was setting up, both by setting up claims regarding persons under color of law, providing for in-camera review, providing for certifications, providing for confidentiality of those certifications, all within very specific procedures. The government has, has, has followed that. When we have a re when this case goes back to Judge Walker, they should present it to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Do you have any rebuttal? Give you two minutes. Is that enough for you? Two and a half. <laughs> thank you, Your Honors. Um, first, we we'll, we'll split the difference. Thank you, Your Honors. First, because the point tends to get lost, I wanted to stress at the outset that at a minimum, we think this court should reverse the district court decision allowing the communication records claim to go forward. The district court acknowledged that claim, the existence of that program or not, was a state secret, and permitting that claim to survive in this litigation uh, was clear error. Um, secondly, with respect to the room, plaintiffs acknowledge, um, first, that the room, the existence of the room is essential to the case, and second, that they don't know what's going on in that room. There could be many things going on in that room. To, just to pick an obvious possibility, there could be FISA court surveillance authorized going on in that room. There could be communications law enforcement assistant activities going on in that room. There could be other activities. Plaintiff's own witness acknowledged that, Mr. Marcus, in his declaration. He concludes, however, that AT&T would have no business justification for those purposes. But whatever he's an expert in, he's not an expert in AT&T's business practices. Third, with respect to the notion of the declaration. Uh, plaintiff, in discussing the declaration with the court today, said something very uh, important, I think. You'd have to look at the words of the declaration very carefully. And I think that that's just the, the beginning of what would happen as soon as there's the type of declaration that we've discussed. There would be litigation over the meaning of every single word, and that would take you exactly back into what is going on or what is not going on in the room, which is a matter squarely protected by the state secrets. Um, fourth, with, fourth, with respect to the Henry Sealed case you mentioned, um, Judge McEwen, you're right, that case is completely different. There was no claim in that case of a secret relationship with the government. The, the privilege was asserted only over two documents, um, and the director of the CIA himself in that case acknowledged the case could go forward with respect to some litigation, and the court distinguished the relevant precedent in that case, El Masri, saying that that case involved a challenge to the legality of a classified program. That's just like this case. Um, with respect to the FISA argument, again, the argument asks this court to adopt the radical interpretation that FISA is a FOIA provision that allows anyone to come off the street and to sue to determine whether they are subject to FISA court surveillance. FISA itself establishes a court um, which has classified proceedings. The existence or not of FISA court surveillance is itself a classified fact. There's nothing in the text of the provision or the purpose of the statute or any other uh, case law that would support that radical interpretation of the statute. Uh, Your Honors, foreign intelligence gathering is an increasingly important tool in assessing the nature of foreign threats and protecting the nation from foreign attack. The district court decision in this case allows this action to proceed at the risk of disclosing the sources, methods, or operational details of the nation's intelligence gathering capabilities. Because that decision 
not only poses an exceptional threat to the national security of the United States, but directly contravenes the legal principles established by this court and the Supreme Court. The district court's decision should be reversed and the case remanded with instructions to dismiss. Thank you very much. Thank you, and this matter will stand submitted. Now we're going to take a, a short break. Uh, we'll give the audience a chance to stretch and, you know, whatever else you want to do. But we'll be back. Don't go away. All right. Now another Ninth Circuit Court case involving a now defunct Oregon charity, Al Haramain Islamic Foundation. Its lawyers claim that the National Security Agency illegally listened to their phone calls. This oral argument is 50 minutes. Now on the second item on the calendar, Al Haramain versus Foundation. I'm sorry, Foundation Inc. versus George W. Bush. Yeah. All right. May it please the court. My name is Thomas Bondi. I represent the appellants the President of the United States at Al. Your Honors, this case is different from the Hepting case that you just heard in a couple of respects. That case, as you know, is a class action challenging alleged dragnet surveillance. This is a case by three plaintiffs alleging that they were actually surveilled in March and April of 2004. Also, Hepting, as you also know, is a case against AT&T, a telecommunications carrier. This is a case directly against the government. Notwithstanding those differences, however, we think the crux of the matter is the same. The state secrets privilege requires dismissal of this case because litigation of plaintiffs' standing or of the merits of their claims would necessarily risk disclosure of sensitive national security information. And indeed, the very subject matter of this case, whether plaintiffs were ever surveilled in the first place, is itself a state secret. Now, of course, uh, the district court's decision and plaintiff's claims turn in very large part on this document that was inadvertently disclosed to plaintiffs by the government. <clears throat> so let me jump, jump right into that, if I may. In the fall of 2004, the government inadvertently disclosed to the plaintiffs a classified document. And let me, let me make clear what that document is and what it still is today. That document, to this day, remains totally classified. It's classified at the top secret level at SCI. It's subject to uh, handling constraints that extend beyond those that would normally be applicable even to top secret information. After the disclosure, the government went through the process of determining whether declassification of the document uh, is warranted. The public record shows and explains that declassification is not warranted, notwithstanding the inadvertent disclosure. The public record also shows that that document cannot meaningfully be described without revealing classified information. Do I understand correctly that copies of it remain in the hands of some of the plaintiffs? Um, that's a difficult question for me to answer since I don't know the exact answer. If they did, I wouldn't necessarily know about it. But, but to tell me what, I'll, I'll tell you what we do know. The district court here, as part of its decision, ordered plaintiffs to surrender to the court any copies of the document they have. And I certainly assume that the plaintiffs have complied with that order. So the, the district court, as part of its decision here, said that the document remains classified in full and remains fully privileged, subject to the state secrets privilege, notwithstanding the inadvertent disclosure, and ordered the plaintiffs to surrender physical copies of the document to the court. Let me, let me just cut to the chip. One was floating out there. I thought I remembered reading that one copy was 
out someplace. For all we know, Your Honor, and again, I want to make clear what I do and do not know. For all we know, it's possible that there are copies, um, for example, with foreign located members of Al Haramain's board of directors. There's some suggestion to that in the case. When the FBI in 2004 uh, conducted an inv investigation and determined who had received copies of the document, I think that investigation was limited within the United States. So within the U.S., the FBI, I think, actually physically visited. Everyone believed to have received a copy of the document, uh, told those people that they had to return the document subject to possible criminal penalties. And the district court then, in this, this case, uh, at the government's urging, ordered but them it, but it to surrender a, their it's copies. It's a secret document, but the district court made some determination that the litigation could go forward based on recollections and other extrapolations from the document that the district court would then examine in camera. If we were to determine that that is at odds with the state secrets doctrine, wouldn't we have to remand the case because it seemed that that whole premise in infused the district court's view of the case, and we don't know what the district court's view would be if that document were basically taken out or sucked out of the litigation. Uh, uh, the premise would certainly require, at a minimum, a remand. And that premise, if I can explain it, is erroneous, we, we submit. But I think the only possible result, after a determination were made that that premise were faulty, would be dismissal of the case. And if I may explain, Your Honor, in this case, in order, everyone agrees that in order to establish their standing in a prima facie case, plaintiffs would have to establish that they were surveilled. They say they can show they were surveilled. And there's one and only one thing they point to for that suggestion, and that is their uh, mental recollection, their, their memory of what remains in their minds of the document. Now let's, let's say that we were to determine that that wouldn't be sufficient because it's a derivative of the secret document itself is we'll have to ask the plaintiffs, but if they had other independent information, which I don't know if they have or do not have, that did not implicate the secret document, then they could go forward at least to establish that there had been surveillance, could they not, as long as it didn't tread on a, tra on a state secret? I don't think so, Your Honor, and let me make clear, as far as, as far as I understand the case, plaintiffs are absolutely clear that the only thing they rely on is the recollection, their recollections of the document. And of course, the district court found, in agreement with the government, the district court found that the document was and remains fully privileged, sub subject to the state secrets privilege, and therefore that document has to be out of the case. How did, the government, out of the, case, how did the government find out that the document had been disclosed? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, Your Honor. But the government, uh, fairly shortly after Didn't the inadvertent... the attorneys alert you to that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, Your Honor. I, you I weren't involved in that process? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. No, I, I just don't know. And You've I, read the FBI investigation and you don't know the answer to that? Uh, I have not read the FBI investigation. I mean, I've read the record of this case. The answer to Your Honor's question is not, not in the record of this case. Okay. Uh, but shor shortly after the inadvertent disclosure was made, the government learned of it and took efforts very promptly to retrieve all copies of the document. But as I was saying, uh, Your Honors, once the document is out of the case, which it has to be because it's privileged, it seems to us quite clear that mental recollections of the document are also out of the case. The only way to test the veracity of those recollections would be to compare them against the document itself. So the proceeding that the district court apparently uh, plans to hold to test or, or to consider plaintiff's recollections of the document, let's be clear, that's a proceeding about the document. What else could it be? If plaintiffs say, we remember that the document says X, Y, Z, the only way to make sense of that assertion and to see whether it's true or false is to compare it to either the document itself and or, I suppose, with what the government comes in and says about the document, the point being then you're talking about the document. But the document is privileged. It's out of this case. Every the, every and, every period, ampersand, and comma. Yes. It's top secret. Huh? Yes. And th there is a public declaration in this case to that effect. It's in the excerpts of record, Your Honor. And it shows that this, do it says, 
that this document and explains is totally non redactable totally non segregable and cannot even be meaningfully described without revealing classified information how did it get over them the first place the government inadvertently <coughs> gave it to the plaintiffs in the process of giving them other materials uh, that it meant to give them. So, so someone wasn't very careful. Someone was not very careful, Your Honor. It was a mistake, and let me make clear, uh, not a mistake by their side, it was a mistake by us. The government made a mistake. But as the district court quite properly concluded, the, the uh, government responsibly acted very promptly to rectify the mistake. And they haven't challenged that, correct? That there are two things. Uh, I'm sorry, Your that, Honor, That ahead. the document can be legitimately retrieved, if you will, and return to its secret status. If I can answer that in two parts, the answer is no, they haven't challenged it, but there are actually two determinations that they haven't challenged. The district court expressly determined in, in its decision, in this case, number one, that notwithstanding the ex accidental disclosure of the document, the document itself remains to this day fully classified. That's number one. And number two, notwithstanding the accidental disclosure, the document remains fully privileged within the scope of the state secrets privilege. The district court said both of those things very clearly in its decision, and I don't read the other side's brief before your honors to take issue at all with either of those determinations. Again, plaintiff's whole point in this case is very simple. They say they, in quotes, know what's in the document. But, I mean, that's wrong and irrelevant for a number of reasons, and mostly it's irrelevant because it doesn't matter what they know. Let's say they believe they know that the document says X, Y, Z. They claim they know that's what it says. As I was saying before, the only way to pursue that point in litigation is to test the veracity of those memories, those recollections, by comparing them against the document. But you can't do that because the document, under the terms of the district court's own decision, is privileged. And if, if I can step back one level, Your Honor, it's not just the document. Well, the district court has a copy of that document, does it not? Uh, in the sealed that? submissions, the classified submissions, the submission. yes, yeah. but that, that's a, 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 again, that's not just a classified document, it's not even just a top secret document. It is subject to SCI restrictions, so that handling and storage restrictions of that document are so stringent that they extend beyond those normally applicable even to top secret information. Is, uh, there, a, is there an English translation of SCI that's not a state secret? Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, that, that's my fault. Sensitive compartmented information. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I should not have used that acronym. Um, if I can step back to one higher level of generality, even beyond the document, Your Honor, the state secrets privilege assertion here covers just the basic question, you know, putting aside the document, covers the basic question of who is or is not subject to foreign intelligence surveillance by the NSA. So just forgetting about the document for a second, although obviously it plays a central role in this case, you know, what plaintiffs are trying to seek here is confirmation or denial of whether or not they were surveilled by the NSA. And the declarations plainly show and explain when the NSA is faced with an allegation by someone seeking confirmation or denial of whether they were surveilled, the only plausible response is to neither confirm nor deny. We don't confirm or deny that you're subject to foreign intelligence surveillance. That wouldn't make any sense. Of course that wouldn't make any sense. The whole point is that no one knows, or at least the United States government, you know, maximize the uncertainty about it and not confirm or deny allegations so that beliefs and uncertainties become known certainties one way or the other. That's absolutely critical. And, Your Honor, I'd also like to add that although the district court here, I think, agreed with much of our position, namely that the, uh, the document uh, is classified and remains subject to the state secrets privilege, the district court I think fundamentally erred in believing that it could, in a sense, work around the privilege by holding what it called an in-camera proceeding. That's what the district court, I think, contemplates will happen next, an in-camera proceeding that in some sense will test plaintiffs' uh, allegations or assertions about their recollections of the document. And that is wrong in a number of respects. First of all, just as a purely legal matter, that's not how the state secrets privilege works. If the state secrets privilege covers the central issues in the case, covers what the case is all about, which is w what is the case here, if once that determination is made, and we think that determination is compelled here, the case law unanimously points to the conclusion that the therefore at the end of that is therefore the claim must be dismissed. It's not therefore we'll hold a secret trial. And that's what the district court contemplates doing here, holding some kind of secret proceeding 
But that's, that is wrong as a matter of law. That's not how the state secret privilege works. Also, it doesn't protect national security. The Supreme Court has been quite clear about that, perhaps most clearly in the Reynolds case, right, where state secret privileged material is at stake. Even an in-camera proceeding where the judge looks at the material in chambers, that's not good enough to protect uh, the security risk at stake in the state secrets context. So the district court here, to the extent the court thought it was properly protest, uh, protecting the national security interests at stake by holding an in-camera proceeding, um, I think that's fundamentally wrong. And again, the proceeding, I know I've said this more than once, would be about the recollections of the document, but that's just the proceeding about the document, and you can't do that if the document is privileged. Another, I'm sorry, Your Honor, go ahead. What if they'd sent a copy of it to a newspaper, like the Pentagon Papers? Well, I'm not sure at this point any of that makes a difference. If, if uh, to uh, answer Your Honor's hypothetical, let's say that a newspaper tomorrow published what it represented was a copy of the document given to them by someone, maybe the, by the plaintiffs in this case. The government would not necessarily confirm or deny that that was the document. Maybe what's published in the newspaper is totally inaccurate. The fact is, absent a government confirmation or denial, no one looking at that thing in the newspaper, including intelligent, uh, hostile intelligence services, knows what it is, knows whether to believe that it's true, maybe it's true, maybe it's false, maybe it's true in part, maybe it's false in part. Just like, Your Honor, another way of answering the same question, if right after this courtroom proceeding, someone on the plaintiff's side were to go across the street and start saying things about the document, what, whatever uh, other implications that might have, criminal or otherwise, that wouldn't undo the state secrets privilege, and it also would not let people know with any degree of certainty what the document actually was uh, or said. And there's a huge difference. So, but what you're saying, I guess, fundamentally, is it doesn't change the classified status of or, it. Or the privilege status. Or the privilege status. Exactly. But if, if the government were not careful in maintaining the classified nature, not necessarily an accidental disclosure, but if the government were not careful, could that not vitiate the classified status of something? There are steps the government could take that would vitiate the state secrets um, privilege, I'm sure, but the accidental disclosure that happened in this case and the immediate prompt steps by the government to rectify that accidental disclosure, that doesn't come anywhere near close, whatever it would be, to, to waive the privilege or to undo the privilege. I mean, that, that's not even close, and that's not argued in this case. Just point a point of procedure, this case has been MDL'd to yes. Judge Walker, yes. so any remand would not be to Judge King. Correct. Uh, there are a number of these cases now part of the larger, and I won't say MDL, Your Honor, I'll say multi-district litigation. Uh, <laughs> but I knew that one, uh, see? I make no assumptions, Your Honor. Um, a number of cases are now part of that MDL proceeding, and this case is one of them. So pre-trial proceedings in any of those cases, at least for the moment, would be before Judge Walker. There are yes. about 50 of those cases. Roughly, I think that's right. There are several <clears throat> dozen of them. So we're back to where we were in the earlier argument, that uh, once uh, officials of the uh, administrative branch of the government uh, declare an item to be a uh, state secret, that ends it. No, Your Honor, and if I could answer that in two different ways. First of all, to give you the same answer that my colleague, Mr. Garr, gave, we're not saying that the courts have no role. The courts have a role. It is the court's authority and responsibility to pass upon the validity of the assertion of the state secrets privilege by the executive branch. So there's a document the state says it's subject to state secret the government does. Yes. And a judge looks at it in camera and says, um, I can see where some of this is subject to state secret as defined by Reynolds and its progeny, but there's some stuff in here that clearly is not. Why can't I produce a redacted copy for use in the litigation? Uh, at least in theory, that would be within the court's purview. But he here, part of the showing, the government has made an extensive showing that is in the record before your honors, both public and non-public. Part of that showing, as I've said, is that the document is totally and completely non-segregable and non-redactable. And your honors are free to pass upon the validity of that assertion as well. Uh, but this is a document that's totally and you know completely classified 
and remain so. And again, uh, Judge Pragerson, if I can also just to put your question in context, please keep in mind what this case is about and what the plaintiffs are asking for. This is a case by individual plaintiffs asking the government to confirm or to deny that they were subject to foreign intelligence surveillance by the NSA. We can't confirm or deny that, and the record explains that. We, we don't confirm or deny that. We say we can't say yes, we can't say no. And that's I guess the what the government has said is that it does have a program in which one in foreign communications where there is an al-Qaeda affiliate, that those are subject to government monitoring, correct? Uh, uh, those are subject to government monitoring, but whether you in particular, but whether that's subject to the possibility of monitoring, right. but whether you in particular were or were not subject to surveillance, and it's not just under that program, under that program or any other program, that's a state secret, for example. And so here you have that program, which is its contours have been made public. At the most general level, Your Honor. And then you have the organization here, which has been deemed through various earlier and separate proceedings to be, as I understand it, a foreign terrorist organization. But you're saying that they lack the third step, which is that that organization or its officers or members were actually subject to any surveillance. Yes, That's and it goes, it, 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 it more than that is missing. Everything Your Honor just said is correct, Pla but plaintiffs believe they were surveilled. One of the many things they don't know and can't establish is even assuming they were surveilled. Let's assume that, which they could never show and never establish absent privileged information. For all they know, if, if there was such a surveillance, and I'm saying if, for all they know, it was fully and lawfully authorized by a FISA court order. That's another thing they don't know. And they could well, never show that. The really important thing in this business is to keep them guessing, huh? It, it is. Absolutely. Is. Yeah. To, to maximize the level of uncertainty. In this case, if it's successful, we'll make certain things certain that now are not certain. And that harms national security. Uh, Your Honors, uh, I, unless the court has any further questions, we would ask that this case be dismissed on uh, grounds of the state secrets privilege and the district court decision reversed. Thank you. May it please the court, John Eisenberg for the plaintiffs. Mr. Bondi says the government made a mistake. And indeed it is true, the government made a very big mistake. They disclosed evidence of surveillance to the victims of the surveillance. Judge King, the district court judge, saw the document and in his opinion, he said, it is not a secret to plaintiffs whether the communications have been intercepted. And I believe that is the key to resolving this case. In the declarations filed pub publicly, Mr. Alexander and Mr. Negropati have given us the reasons for the state secret privilege. Two reasons. First of all, we don't want to know the targets of surveillance to know that they are being surveilled because then they will change their behavior accordingly. Well, that reason doesn't exist here anymore because the victims of this surveillance know they were surveilled because of the government's, government's mistake. Second reason for the privilege, we need to protect the secret operational details, means, and methods by which our nation's intelligence community conducts surveillance. I agree. That should be kept secret. There's no need for the public to know. There's no need for my clients to know in order to demonstrate their standing. It does not matter how they were surveilled. What matters is that they were surveilled. Yeah, is, it, is it true as the government represented that other than the document itself and your client's recollection that they have no other information that would establish standing that they were in fact surveilled? No, that is not true. The document is the central feature of the evidentiary showing of standing that will be made below in this case if we are given the opportunity. So assume you don't have the document. 
tell us what the proof is. Okay, let me, what we have here is a number of government admissions about the document. They have said in their declarations that it is a government report. It relates to al Haramain Islamic Foundation. It contains information about National Security Administration activities. Those activities of this agency include signals intelligence. Signals intelligence is derived from electronic surveillance. Now let's look at what the government has told us in public us in public statements and in the pleadings in this case about the warrantless surveillance program. It is a program of warrantless surveillance which targets persons whom the government believes have links to al-Qaeda. How does the government describe al-Haramain in this case? The government says they have links to al-Qaeda, an assertion which, by the way, the plaintiffs very passionately deny. All of this is in the public domain, domain. We have an allegation of surveillance in March and April of 2004. The government has conceded that they were conducting a program of warrantless surveillance of believed target, uh, of people believed to be linked to al-Qaeda during that time period. What's your, what's your evidence of the time frame being March to April 2004? That evidence is does it derive potentially from the document, or does it have an independent basis? It derives from the document. Okay. And that's why I say the document is a central feature. I thought you were going to give us a list yeah, of Yeah, I thought you were telling us it isn't a I mean, so we, we're document kind of mixing no, and matching. No, no, no. What, we, what I've given you is everything that's public. The last link in all of that is the document itself, which Judge, Walk, Judge King saw and read. And he thereby concluded I am going to give the plaintiffs just what they need to make this showing of standing, not access to the document, which we had asked for, but the ability to tell the court in sealed filings what we have seen, what but we doesn't, know. Doesn't, my concern about that is it seems to me that that really flies in the face of Reynolds, which basically says that you shouldn't jeopardize security, which the privilege is meant to protect. So if if you have a document which is a national security top secret document and it's been retrieved, if you will, but your clients are permitted to establish constitutional standing under the document, then what's the difference of just having saying, well, the document's not really top secret. They get to retell, they can get to tell you what they remember because they saw the document. It seems to me that's no different than having the document. The crucial difference between our case and Reynolds is in the need, the, the need for the document, the need for the evidence, and the availability, avail, availability or not of alternatives. What happened in Reynolds is the government said, we do not want to produce these investigatory reports on this plane crash over which the plaintiffs were suing, but we will make available for you to interview people involved in the crash. There was an alternative. The court said, this is a quote, here, necessity was greatly minimized by an available alternative. The court was saying there is no need for this evidence here when the government has offered an alternative. And but, what, but what is the status of the document if something is a top secret document, which the government says is SCI, I like that, I'm going to use that now. Um, it's an SCI document, so no one is entitled access to that without the appropriate clearances. But your clients basically piggyback on that. Doesn't that basically pull the rug out from under any kind of Clear, uh, classified nature of the document, if you can use it? Well, what we did is we proposed alternatives, as was done in Reynolds. We proposed several, as did Judge King. We suggested, for example, redaction. I do not believe that every single syllable, a letter in this document, in, uh, puts the nation, nation security at risk. Your well, what honest? if you got back a document that said, 
the and or dot dot or and the but all we need is that a wouldn't help you would it no all we need is a document that shows your was client's name there was surveillance but that means that you need a document with your client's name no actually not organization or actually something? actually not um what do you there know? are certain um links that are completed by the sealed declarations of the plaintiffs themselves in this case, uh, Gafor and Ballou. So now actually very little in the document needs to be uh, reviewed by the court. All that is necessary to know from the document is that there was surveillance. Sealed affidavits by the parties can supply the links. But the sealed affidavits are derived from the document. Yes, but this is, no, 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 you know, but actually. I feel like I'm Alice in Wonderland what, because what you're saying is yeah. the document is essential, but it really isn't because my client can really just talk about the document. Well, he just pulled Alice back into the. I feel like I'm in this Alice in Wonderland, too, because I cannot tell you. I, I have filed a sealed filing in the case, and arguing, arguing what's in the document. I cannot mention it today. I understand that. Okay, so there's certain and we've things. Read the, and we've read the sealed filing. Yes. So what's in there is kind of not central to my question. It's the fact that whether the sealed documents that you reference as the foundation are derived from the classified document. And I guess the answer is yes. The sealed document Yes, the answer is yes. The sealed document is classified. That is not determinative of the state secret issue. The yep. issue is not whether or not the document is classified. The issue is whether this litigation puts national security at risk. Is and it essential to your claim that there was no warrant or other court certification? The document itself, I do not believe, is essential to the element of it being no, warrantless. I'm not talking about the document at all. Is it essential? I'm asking, asking you essentially the same claim, same question we asked the Hepting parties in the prior case. Is it essential to your claim that any surveillance of your clients was done without warrant or court authority? Yes. We have to show there was no warrant in order to show a FISA violation. The government has taken the position that it is a state secret even whether or not there was a FISA warrant. Let me direct your attention to FISA section 1809, which provides for a defense as follows. It is a defense, this is 1809B. It is a defense that surveillance was authorized by and conducted pursuant to a court order. So Congress has provided a defense for the government to our action. Their defense is we had a FISA warrant. If, fi if Congress has provided for that defense, how can it possibly be a state secret? It cannot. Well, are proceedings before the FISA court public? No. No, they are not. Including whether they've authorized a warrant or not? No, they are not. They are secret. However, FISA, in FISA, Congress has prescribed this being a defense. If the government is accused of surveillance without a warrant, they may present evidence that they did have a warrant. And that will be the end of the FISA action. That has not happened in this case. And I might add that while the government was not required to make any sealed filings below or on appeal in order to defend its position, they did choose to make those filings below and on appeal. I must assume they have not told the district court or this court that they had a warrant in those sealed filings or we would not be here today. Judge King would have dismissed the action. That tells me a lot about on the ground common sense reality in this case. They availed themselves of a secret means of communicating with the trial court judge. They could have put a quick end to litig this litigation, if indeed there had been a warrant, they evidently did not. If, if the government had not made its acknowledged mistake of revealing the document, 
would you have a basis to bring this lawsuit? No, we wouldn't know we were surveilled. That's, that was why this was such a big mistake. The government was conducting a program of warrantless surveillance in secret that we believe was unlawful. Had they not made a mistake and revealed it to the victims of one particular surveillance, who would be out there to sue? It's the very nature of the secrecy. The government has taken the position that because this must be secret, it can never be litigated. And Judge Pegerson asked a question earlier during the EFF argument, the Hefting argument. He said, if we are at war, does that mean that executive power is unchecked? And Mr. Gar said, no, it doesn't. But really, he's arguing that it does. Because the government's argument in Hepting and here is that the very subject matter of these actions, the warrantless surveillance program, what the, what the government now calls the TSP, the very subject matter is a state secret. You, the courts, may not litigate this case under any circumstances, and it doesn't matter what the plaintiffs know. What they know, you may not litigate this. Now, in my view... That, that means, we, though, we would have to accept his view that the very essence of the case, the topic, is a state secret. Yes. And, and here, as we've talked about, although in broad contours and not details, we know quite a lot about the TSP, correct? Okay. So yes. that can't be a state secret, right? All right. So let's dispose of their first argument. They have made two... So that seems like not a very good argument if they're making it. I couldn't agree with you more. They've got two arguments. One is the very subject matter is a state secret. That doesn't wash, I don't think. All right, let's go to the other argument. The plaintiff's surveillance themselves, and in this particular case, is a state secret. Now, the answer to that question lies in the declarations of Mr. Negroponte and Mr. Alexander, again, twofold. The danger is they'll learn of their surveillance and change their activity. That's not an issue here because they already know, and if they've had any opportunity to change their uh, behavior, it's been indulged. The second danger is we cannot reveal the operational details of the program without endangering national security. My answer is I agree. You don't have to. We don't need to know. We don't want to know. We just want to make the one showing that we need to make to get to a decision on the merits. The merits issue is does the president have inherent authority to disregard an act of Congress in the name of national security. That is the issue that will become law by default. If there is a state secrets dismissal in this case, because what it means is that the government need only invoke the state secrets privilege and say this is something where the very subject matter is secret and you, the courts, can't deal with it. You're not competent to deal with it. Well, if that's the case, then as a practical reality, they're right. The president does have inherent authority to do whatever he wishes in the name of national, national security during a time of war. That can't be right. It just can't. It wasn't... But what there is, of course, some check on that. If, if that's the proposition, there is some check with respect to determining what is or is not a state secret because the federal courts have some authority in that regard, do they not? Yes. The, another question from the bench was, what is our job here? I think the answer to that question is in the case of Ellsberg versus Mitchell, way back when. The more compelling a litigant's showing of need for the information in question, the deeper the court should probe in satisfying itself that the occasion for invoking the privilege is appropriate. There is a big need here, creating a need for this court to probe deeply. What's the big need? The big need is that we need to be able to refer to this document in order to show our standing to challenge the legality of the program. We need this evidence. I have conceded to you today that without this well, evidence... Well, sort of like whether, whether we got a warrant or we didn't get a warrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we that's need to show surveillance. That's, that's the secret. Yes, right. right. Because part of, 
because part of it being a secret is for other folks not to know one way or another. Yes. Because sometimes it's as important to know what the other side thinks it knows. Right. It may not be true. So, you know, the whole thing, too, could have been a charade by giving you a document. See what I mean? I see what you mean, yes. Uh, so so I, I guess the question, and uh, perhaps what we're getting at is, do we really know we were surveilled? Maybe it was a fake. Maybe there was no surveillance after all, because I, as I say, we need to show we were surveilled. That is certainly a central element of our FISA cause of action. Surveillance, electronic, without a warrant. Were we really surveilled? The government has proposed a number of scenarios, some conjecture, I would call it. Well, maybe this, maybe that, maybe the other. Maybe the government found this out through word of mouth, for example. What I would refer you to would be the standard of proof for showing standing. We are attempting to show standing here. That's what we want to do if we are allowed the opportunity to go back to Judge King, Judge Walker now, and make our case for standing. The standard of proof for showing standing is simply preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. Do we have enough evidence here, combining the document and everything else I've mentioned that's public knowledge today, to constitute direct and circumstantial evidence from which a reasonable inference could be drawn that our clients were surveilled electronically without a warrant? I believe the answer to that question has to be yes. And let's look at it well, from... If you have, let's just take a privilege that's not nearly as kind of high-flying as the state secrets privilege, the attorney-client privilege. If you had a document that had been inadvertently disclosed, but your clients got to read it, but then is excluded from the litigation as an attorney-client document, you couldn't use your recollection from that document to establish something in the litigation, could you? I suppose you couldn't. Uh, so we, why would this be any different? It was the, le it was the, the most conservative resolution to the issue, I believe. We argued that we should have access to the document. That was the issue that was, that was before the court below. The judge said, I don't need to go that far. How about if I just let you file an affidavit describing the document from memory? I didn't hear an answer to Judge McCune's question. I thought you said you suppose you couldn't use the document. Yes, and, correct. And you could not use your correct. recollection. Yes, that was, my, that was my answer. Yes, my answer was I believe it would have been yes. The, the, the question I, I thought I heard her ask was, how is this different? How is this different? Okay. How is an attorney-client privilege document inadvertently disclosed, stricken from the record, returned, blah, 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 different from what happened here in terms of its use in a court proceeding? Okay. Thank you. That, I, that's helpful. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, it is different because there are no state, and with the attorney-client privilege doc, uh, hypothetical you have given, attorney-client privilege information is at risk. In our case, there is no state secrets at risk because the bell has been rung. Well, but you see, that's a judgment that the court has to make by looking at the sealed document. I, absolutely. But the bell was rung in the attorney-client as well because the, it's the communication between A and B that is the privilege and the attorney-client privilege. And of course, when you tell somebody, a third party, if you tell them affirmatively, of course, you ruin the privilege. If it's accidental, like here the disclosure was, well, the privilege doesn't go away, and the reason for the privilege doesn't go away, even so if somebody else gets to know. Um, I think in a way, you have to kind of wipe that out. Don't you have to? It's, it's sort of, I realize it's a bit of a ruse in the attorney-client privilege, because what they say to the attorneys and the other people is, well, you saw this thing, but you can't use it. Right. You can't use it. That's, that's the key. And you well, can't you use information derived from it. With the attorney-client privilege, there is a remedy. You cannot use it, and therefore, the preclusion from use remediates the, the damage done from the disclosure. The damage from the disclosure of this document has been done and cannot be remediated. These client, these people... Well, I, don't, I don't see how it's any different in attorney... If, if you have some very highly confidential settlement negotiations, you're laying out your theory of the case, and the other side 
it, get, it gets over there by fax, by accident, which has happened a number of times in law firms sending accidental faxes. The other side now knows your strategy. You can't say, well, it's remediated because they, quote, can't well, use it. Well, they can, they can use it. There's no remedy for that. But can they use it in court? Like that's the do. question. Can they use it in court? Can they use it in court? And there's a reason to keep them from doing it. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to keep our clients from using it here because the government has told us the reason to keep them from using it is to prevent them from altering their conduct. And that cannot be undone. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. You got any rebuttal? Would, would you start where he left off? Because he says if, if the reason for the classification and the secret is so that the targets don't know and so you have operational details, he says those are kind of out the window at this point. Well, so okay. there goes the secret. There are two problems with that. Uh, first of all, starting with them, they don't know. And let me make clear what I mean by that. I'm not talking about the document because the document is secret. <clears throat> what I am talking about is their statements to you in their brief, and I would point to page 24 of the red brief in particular. When plaintiffs explain what they mean when they say they, in quotes, know, they don't know. What they mean when they say that is that they, although they think or believe or claim they were surveilled, it's possible that they weren't surveilled, or it's possible that any surveillance was supported fully lawfully, in their view, by a FISA court order, but that information, in plaintiff's words on page 24 of their brief, would be peculiarly within the knowledge of the government. Exactly. Indeed, it would be. It's, uh, they, they just can't get access to that, and they admit it on page 24 of the brief. So that's the first point. When they say they know, it, what they mean by that on their, on their own terms, they don't know. That's number one. Number two, it does not matter what they know. The harm to national security here, on a broader level, is to protect public disclosure of this information, to protect the world from knowing. And whatever they know, or believe they know, or claim to know, it is absolutely clear and undisputed that the world at large, the whole world, does not know whether or not any of the plaintiffs were surveilled. The world doesn't know that. The only what we, the world knows what they think they know, whatever exactly. that is. Exactly, and that's, that's less than actually knowing whether it's true. Boy, we that's are really the same splitting thing. the nose. No, but that, that, that's, that's a huge difference. Sounds the government like, hasn't confirmed or denied. It reminds me of some Don Rumsfeld, yeah. But, Your Honor, I mean, let me be, let me be plain. It, it's entirely possible, and I'm not saying one way or the other, obviously. Right, because you, don't, you possible, can't know, and we can't know. And it's entirely possible that everything they think they know, just to give one example, is completely false. Possible, or maybe it's partly true. There are things we true. know that we know, and there are things we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> right. You know, one, one time, one time I, I had a, a, a criminal case in my better life when I was a district judge, and uh, someone from a local police department uh, brought me some uh, file to look, uh, look at in camera, see? And I looked at it. I said, I don't see anything here. What's this all about? He says, well, Judge, what's important is not what we know, but what they think we know. That's what you're saying. Um, what I'm saying here is that, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying here is that the, on a, the broadest level, the, w w the national security interest in this case isn't in any way limited to what the plaintiffs know or think they know. The world at large You're doesn't know. You're saying that whatever they divine from the document may right. or may not be. Right, and the rest of the world has no way to know. What, the, what, what plaintiffs are trying to get in this case is to get it officially confirmed one way or the other, whether they were surveilled. If that were officially confirmed or denied one way or the other, that would be something of interest to people who are, you know, hostile intelligence uh, entities who watch this stuff. That, that would be a disclosure that matters, and that's the disclosure. Do you think they're watching this argument just to see if oh, yeah. anybody knows? Well, uh, I, 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 I go back to my basic point. We, we just can't confirm or deny, and this is explained in detail in the record. We just can't confirm or deny who is or is not subject 
to foreign intelligence surveillance. And respectfully, Your Honors, I think that's just a basic point, and it's explained in detail. Let me ask one last question. Is that, do you know of any other case where a document has been deemed to be a national security document, and yet someone was allowed to proceed forward, not with the document, but with either some recollection or notion? No. No, I mean, we think that, I'm not aware of any. We think that theory is quite evidently wrong, respectfully, Your Honors, and we're not aware of any precedent for it. Unless the court has any further questions, the government has nothing more. All right. Everybody go in peace, and this court will adjourn. All rise. This court for this session stands adjourned. Next on C-SPAN 2, a report on global